Hello and welcome and thank you for joining with us today here at Warrigal Anglican Church in the beautiful Gippsland region of Victoria, Australia. We're pleased that you're with us today and we're looking forward to a service inside. It'll be a service out of the Anglican Prayer Book for Australia. Perhaps you are a through and through Anglican and you've got a prayer book at home. That's great. Um, you'll be able to use that. If you don't, um, it's great to have you with us. We're going to put all the prayers, all the Bible readings, all the responses up on the screen as we move through the service. I'm the Reverend Tracy Lowerson and I have the great privilege of leading the church here in Warrigal. Um, and I'm so pleased that you've joined with us today. I hope that the service is a real blessing for you. Let's go in. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Let's pray this prayer of preparation together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Hear the two great commandments. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus said, this is the great and first commandment and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners like you and me and inviting us to his table. Let us confess our sins. Let us confess our failure to live up to those two commands that sum up the others um, and approach God with a sincere and a true heart in confession. There'll be a prayer of confession that comes up on the screen. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. We haven't loved you with our whole heart. We haven't loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life through Christ our Lord. Amen. And Almighty God, who promises forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and I and set us free from all our sins. Strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in eternal life through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's say together this hymn of praise. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. We're now going to say our, our prayer of the week. We're gonna hear our Bible reading, hear a sermon, Say some prayers, and then we'll come back to this table for communion. We've been working our way through a series of prayer, and I'm going to start with our Bible reading for the day, and I'm going to pray ahead of that reading. Please pray with me. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing the way of salvation through faith in your Son. We ask that now you would teach us and encourage us through your word so that we can be ready to serve you for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Bible reading today is from Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through to 15. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For, Jesus went on, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So we're doing a series on the Lord's Prayer, trying to learn about prayer as we go along. And today we look at that line, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. There are few things harder than forgiveness. The great American preacher who passed away a couple of years ago, Haddon Robinson, he told, told the story about what was the hardest time, he said, in his life. He and his wife, Bonnie, were sued by a young student, a seminary graduate. Uh, he writes, they had tried to help her. On several occasions, his wife had been at her house and even cleaned it for her. They'd had her over for dinner. 
And he said that when they were served with a lawsuit, it felt as though they had tried to wash someone's feet and had their teeth kicked in instead. He said they were blamed for things they weren't responsible for. They were subjected by lawyers to allegations. The lawyers constructing a case the Robinsons didn't believe was honest. I don't know what the lawsuit was about, but I know Americans are pretty litigious a group. And Haddon Robinson, a great Christian leader, said he wishes he could write that he had forgiveness in his heart as this went on. But he said, at that time, I would have been happy if that woman got run over by a truck. Forgiveness is very hard. Forgiveness is hard. Um, I was also reminded as I prepared this sermon about uh, a situation my parents had found themselves in. It happened when I was just about 18 years old. I'd just left home. And they were selling their home in Sydney to move up to the Gold Coast to semi-retire. They sold their home, moved everything up to Queensland. My father moved up there and uh, mum stayed behind just just for another week um, until the settlement of the property with just a little suitcase and a fold-up bed. The rest of the house, the rest of this big five-bedroom house was entirely empty. Now, unfortunately, um, the buyer's finance fell through. And what ought to have happened was that the buyer would have, uh, pr prospective buyer would have lost their deposit and mum and dad would have been able to sell their property to someone else. But this man was so keen on the house and so keen not to lose his deposit that he put what's called a caveat on the property. Caveat means you can't sell it, you can't do anything with that property until the caveat is discussed in court. And so my poor mother, with her little fold-up bed and a small suitcase of clothes, ended up having to stay in that house for, I think it was a couple of months extra, and to pay a lot of money to barristers, which ate away at their retirement savings, just to remove this caveat. I mean, the nice ending to the story is that another buyer came along soon and made them an even better offer. Um, but it was just a terrible, terrible, stressful, expensive time. And I don't know if my mother ever forgave that man who tried to cling to a home that he couldn't afford. Forgiveness is hard to do. What about you? Um, is there someone who has wronged you? Someone who has wronged you? And have you forgiven them? Why is this line even in the Lord's Prayer? Why is it so important? Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. It is the first, therefore a priority, spiritual petition which is in the Lord's Prayer. The first spiritual petition that Jesus says we ought to pray, forgive us our debts, uh, which is a finance term, um, but it's a metaphor for sin. And Luke, in his gospel, actually translates the word as sin in his version of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us when we fall short of what we owe to God. And what we owe to God is we, we owe him our, our life, our honour, uh, we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. And so we pray this prayer, forgive us when we fall short of doing that, God. Um, forgive us. Let our debt go. Just cancel it. Tolerate us. Remove the debt of sin. Um, and to forgive is to release us, to let it pass, to let it drop. Send it away. Um, in classical literature, to forgive meant the voluntary release of a person or thing over whom you have legal rights. You're letting them go. And so we pray, forgive us our debts, forgive us our sins, and as, as we do this for others too, who are in our debt, uh, because they've wronged us. It sounds a bit like a, an exchange. God, you do this for me, forgive me my debts, and, and then I'll do it. You go first, and I will forgive others who owe me something as well. Um, and you can read that and think, well, maybe this is sounding like salvation by works. I have to forgive people for God to forgive me. But this is not about that. This is not a sinner's prayer. This is not a prayer of conversion that we pray for the forgiveness of our sins um, and for salvation. Um, we know that we are saved by grace. We're all sinners, Paul wrote in the book of Romans. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. And we're saved by grace, God's unmerited kindness to us in Jesus Christ. So the Lord's Prayer doesn't change this into a salvation by works thing. The Lord's Prayer is a believer's prayer. Remember just before Jesus um, 
taught this, he was teaching generally about prayer and he said, you know, when you pray, just go into your room in private and speak to your heavenly father who knows all your needs. This is a believer's prayer. Um, a, it's a prayer, though, for a believer who lives in the very real world where slights and offences and dysfunction and suffering and evil permeate our lives. The real world where we are wronged and where we wrong others as well. The Lord's Prayer, when we pray this line, forgive us our debts as we forgive others, it's the prayer for the believer who wants to keep short accounts with God um, and to walk in the ways of the Lord Jesus who said that we should love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. R.T. Kendall in his commentary on this passage says, there are two assumptions that are being said in this line by what Jesus teaches here. The first assumption is that we're going to need forgiveness <laughs> ongoingly. Um, and the second assumption is that we're going to need to forgive others. Uh, we need forgiveness. And, you know, ironically, this is, this is a line in the prayer which others have probably prayed about me and you, even us unknowingly, when we've offended other people and they've prayed this prayer and we're the ones that come to their mind. We need forgiveness not just to enter into salvation, but until the Lord returns, we see him face to face and we're no longer struggling with sin. And the second assumption, we need to forgive others for all sorts of evil, from the minor to the major. Um, in this life, we will have plenty of opportunities to be offended by someone. Uh, we're sinners, other people are sinners, uh, hurtful relationships happen, lies, gossips, accusations, anger, hatred, um, you know, you may have to face them all. And so this is a very cleansing prayer. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. As I said, sometimes we're forgiving someone for something little and forgiveness comes easy, but sometimes we're giving, forgiving someone for something very traumatic and it's a hard thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do. As Haddon Robinson wrote, um, in, when he talked about this lawsuit, he said there, was, there were times when he couldn't even speak about it to God. He would just, in his prayer, say, God, you know what's happened. You know what's on my heart. You do it. You, you forgive her. <laughs> I can't forgive her right now. Um, other times he would pray, Lord, you know I think she's done us wrong. You take the vengeance. You do it. And finally he would pray, Lord, you're a forgiving God and you've forgiven me, and on that basis, I can begin to forgive her. Forgiveness of terrible things takes time, and I think it's a great idea to ask God to do it for you at first. Uh, forgiveness is incredibly complex, um, especially because sometimes we bear some guilt in a particular situation. It's incredibly complex too when there's deep trauma involved. In the case of serious trauma, we can't, forgiveness cannot be demanded of us, um, nor does it mean that there's no consequences for the offender. Forgiveness doesn't mean we're then going to trust our offender. Forgiveness doesn't mean we're saying, sure, do it again. Forgiveness doesn't mean we accept intolerable behaviour. But forgiveness does mean we're letting go. Psychologists at Berkeley University say this is how we should define forgiveness. They say, psychologists generally define forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision to release our feelings of resentment or vengeance towards a person or a group who has harmed us. Just as important as defining what forgiveness owes is, though, is understanding what forgiveness is not. Experts who study or teach it make clear that when you forgive, you are not glossing over. You are not denying the seriousness of an offence against you. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting, and it doesn't mean condoning or excusing offences. Though forgiveness can help repair a damaged relationship, it doesn't obligate you to reconcile with the person who harmed you or release them from their legal accountability. Instead, forgiveness brings the forgiver peace of mind and frees him or her from corrosive anger. 
Whilst there is some debate over whether true forgiveness requires positive feelings towards the offender, experts agree that it at least involves letting go of deeply held negative feelings. And in that way, it empowers you both to recognise the pain you've suffered without letting that pain define you, enabling you to heal and move on with your life. I can't read that without thinking, Jesus knew all of that. And that is why he said to us, when you pray the Lord's Prayer, make sure that the first petition you say is, Lord, forgive me my sins as I forgive those that sin against us. Forgiveness is complex and it's hard when it's about hard things. But it's necessary if we're truly going to be God's people, if we're going to be kingdom people. Um, amazing, too, to reflect on the fact that God moved to forgive us before we were born. God moved to forgive us by, by coming into the world. Um, Jesus said on the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do. Uh, God didn't wait for us to seek forgiveness. God made the first move and he calls us to be people who make the first move as well, to live a life of love and grace. Uh, he is the God who is all about relationships. We have Father, Son and Spirit in beautiful relationships since before creation who wants us to be in these wonderful relationships too. And we, we just cannot flourish. And we cannot bring healing to the world on behalf of God. We cannot be whole if we proceed as unforgiving people. Unforgiveness is really debilitating. It's like being a plane that can't take off because its wheels are locked onto the tarmac. Or it's like, you know, all those wonderful Christian fruits of the spirit that we read about, love, joy, peace, patience, self-control and compassion, uh, joy, all of those things. If, if they were like a computer program, it's like you can't install that until you can uninstall other programs like bitterness and anger and hatred, uh, revenge. We have to shut all of those things down first to access the other. In the Bible, there's a story in the Old Testament about a character, one of King David's sons, Absalom. And Absalom was third in the line to the throne. And he became, through other circumstances, he becomes first, but he never gets to get on the throne because, um, well, let me tell you the story. Um, Absalom had a brother, Amnon, and he had a sister, Tamar, uh, others as well and you know this was in the era when kings had concubines and they would have had lots of half brothers half sisters so Amnon one of the brothers um, lusts after one of the sisters Tamar and to cut a long story short he ends up raping Tamar who is Absalom's sibling Absalom is so upset um, David King David is upset but for some reason doesn't punish Absalom and uh, doesn't punish Am Amnon. And Absalom just nurses his hatred of his brother for about two years, plotting, plotting, hating, filled with disappointment, filled with anger. And ultimately, after two years, he arranges for his brother Amnon to be murdered. He doesn't do it with his own hands, but he arranges for others to murder him. And he flees justice. He goes back to where he grew up, where people probably um, comforted him about the justice that he'd been doing rather than made him face up to the terrible thing that he's done. After another three years or so, he comes back to Jerusalem. He's still not uh, forgiving. He's not submitting uh, to, to paying for, for the sins that he's committed. He's completely unrepentant. He's completely arrogant. In fact, he decides he's going to claim the throne and he plots to have his own father overthrown. He's almost successful. David has to flee Jerusalem. But everyone recognises that Absalom is not king material and he himself, after the coup, has to flee. He has long hair, long flowing thick hair and he's riding a horse out of town and his hair gets caught as he goes and he ends up hanging in a tree and he's murdered, uh, murdered by the people who do not want him to be king. But as we look at his life, it all started when this terrible thing happened to his sister and he could not find... Um, he could not find the way back to being forgiving. Instead, he was unforgiving um, and unrepentant, and it ruined his life. Unforgiveness is destructive. 
um, and forgiveness is good for our soul. Maybe that's why we read in Romans chapter 12, don't repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Well, do you need to forgive someone? If you're praying right now, and the line went, so you're praying something like this, Lord, help me to forgive. Who would it be that you need to forgive? As Haddon Robinson suggested, ask God to forgive them first if you can't find it in your heart yet. Pray through the pain and suffering and brokenheartedness. Surrender all those bitter feelings to God. Give God the vengeance. Release the past hurt when you can and repeat that as often as necessary. Because sadly, we can say we'll forgive someone and then we find ourselves, that name pops up again for us because the hurt comes up again. Dr. Richard Dobbins, a Christian counsellor, uh, points out an, another Old Testament scripture in Jeremiah 18, 1 to 4. It says this, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house and there I'll give you a message. So I went down to the potter's house and I saw the potter working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. A wonderful metaphor of what God, um, what the Holy Spirit can do in our lives when we bring our hurts, when we bring our wounds. Um, yes, we have hurts and wounds, but we can be reshaped uh, into something beautiful. God can reshape our lives into good and better things. So let us pray. Lord, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Amen. Friends, as we approach our time of communion, at home you might like to gather some bread and juice so that you can have some communion at home. Or you may simply want to participate just in the, the prayers that we go through as we, as we go through this part of the service. Uh, if you want to gather some bread and juice, you might want to pause the video for a moment. We'll also have a, a prayer that you can pray up on the screen as we move through this service. But right now, let's make a statement about what it is that we believe as Christian people by saying together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and from there he will come to judge both the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy worldwide church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, as we approach our time of communion, let's pray this prayer of approach. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son Christ and drink his blood, grant that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Well, friends, lift up your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, all glory and honour be yours always and everywhere, mighty creator and ever-living God. We give you thanks and praise for our Saviour Jesus Christ, who by the power of your Spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, 
he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of might and power, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Well, as we come to the table, we remember all that these symbols mean. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and after he had broken it, he gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and again giving thanks to you, he uh, gave it to the disciples saying, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We say together the memorial acclamation, Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Well, friends, if you have bread and juice at home or wine, you might like to take that now and give thanks to God. If you're participating in this service um, by simply following the prayers, there'll be a prayer that comes up on screen. Let's do that now. Let's pray this prayer as we close our service. Renew us by your Holy Spirit. Unite us in the body of your Son. Bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom. Through Christ our Lord, with whom, in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. Blessing and honour, glory and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. Most loving God, you send us out into the world you love. Give us grace to go thankfully and with courage in the power of your spirit. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.